The Corliss engine does not lend itself to description. It rises loftily in the center of the huge structure, an athlete of steel and iron with not a superfluous ounce of metal on it. In the midst of this ineffably strong mechanism is a chair where the engineer sits reading his newspaper, as in a peaceful bower. Now and then, he clambers up one of the stairways that cover the framework and touches some irritated spot on the giant's body with a drop of oil. He is like some potent enchanter there, and this prodigious afreet is his slave, who could crush him past all semblance of humanity with the lightest touch. It is, alas, what the afreet has done to humanity too often, where his strength has superseded men's industry. But of such things, the machinery hall is no place to speak. And to be honest, one never thinks of such things here. One thinks only of the glorious triumphs of skill and invention. This description of the huge steam engine built by the inventor, George Corliss, was written in 1876 by the American writer, William Dean Howells. The Corliss steam engine was the main attraction in Machinery Hall at the Philadelphia Exposition, celebrating the 100th anniversary of American independence. Howell's ambivalent reaction to this technological giant ushered in the era of technology in the garden. Visitors to the Philadelphia Centennial Exposition in 1876 assured themselves that man's inventive genius had gone about as far as it could go. During that centennial summer, Thomas A. Edison moved into his invention factory on this hill in Menlo Park, New Jersey, overlooking the Pennsylvania Railroad tracks. Edison built his laboratory at Menlo Park for the frank purpose of pursuing patents. He put together a team of chemists, engineers, model makers, theoretical scientists, mathematicians, and skilled mechanics. Between 1876 and 1882, they developed more than 300 patents. In 1878, Thomas Edison was 31 years old, but he already had enough invention to cut it a lifetime. The press recognized this achievement, calling him the Wizard of Menlo Park. Beginning with his improved stock ticker of 1869, his contribution to telegraphy alone were enough to establish him as the premier electrical inventor of his day. Successful dealings with the telegraph empire builders of New York had given Edison the means to construct his unique laboratory in the New Jersey countryside. And there at Menlo Park, he and a group of loyal co-workers operated a true invention factory. Unquestionably, the chief among Edison's co-workers was the English-born mechanic, Charles Batchelor. Raised in Manchester, 
and receiving most of his training in textile mills, Batchelor came to America at age 22 to help a Newark factory with its installation of machinery. When he shortly thereafter joined Edison, he quickly became an indispensable part of the operation. Soon after the Menlo Park lab was completed in the spring of 1876, Edison and his team moved beyond telegraphy. The broad range of approaches Edison used in his inventive efforts sometimes yielded surprising results, as when in late 1877, experiments on repeating and recording devices for use with telegraphs or telephone resulted in the phonograph. The push for Edison's efforts in electric lighting research was provided by his visit in September 1878 to the Connecticut factory of William Wallace & Sons, America's foremost brass and copper foundry. William Wallace had been experimenting with electricity and electric lighting for almost a decade and had built a dynamo in 1874. Upon his return to Menlo Park, Edison dived immediately into the task of trying to produce a practical electric light. The focus of lamp efforts continued to be on the burner. How to prevent unthinkably high temperatures from destroying a material through burning or cracking. Because of its electrical and heat resistance, carbon was a natural choice for use in an incandescent lamp. Precautions had to be taken to prevent it from burning up by enclosing it in an inert gas or vacuum. In October 1879, Bachelor was experimenting in his usual methodical fashion, constructing a series of lamps with various types of carbon filaments. In the middle of the night of October 22nd, 1.30 by Bachelor's account. The bulb with the simple carbonized thread were connected to an 18-cell battery. After it had burned for 13 and a half hours, more cells were added. It continued to burn for another hour before the glass bulb overheated and cracked. The transition at Menlo Park from a search for a feasible lamp to a practical and marketable product was rapid. This reflected Edison's basic attitude that an invention was valuable only if it could be used and sold. No time was lost in assembling a demonstration system. On New Year's Eve, 1879, Edison put on public display not simply his carbon lamp, but the first detailed version of a complete electric light and power system. Edison's laboratory was tonight thrown open to the general public for inspection of his electric light. The laboratory was brilliantly illuminated with 25 electric lamps, the office and counting room with eight, and 20 others were distributed in the street leading to the depot and in some of the adjoining houses. The method of regulating the supply of electricity at the central station was explained in detail, as was also the electric motor. The latter was made to pump water and run a sewing machine with only as much electricity as was necessary to give an illumination of the brilliancy of an ordinary gas jet. The effort at Menlo Park had always been guided by economic consideration. But by the end of 1879, with a practical lamp of reality, questions of the economy of a central station electric light and power system came to the forefront. Because the success of their system seemed to depend so much on a high level of usage in a relatively small area, Edison and his colleagues always framed their development work in terms of concentrated urban use, specifically in a portion of New York City. As the electric light moved from the laboratory into the working world, Edison moved himself from Menlo Park to New York. The most important step was the incorporation on December 17, 1880, of the Edison Electric Illuminating Company of New York. Most of Edison's time in New York was divided between work on the underground distribution system and the development of large dynamos in the shops of the Edison Machine Works. The dynamos providing electricity to New York's first district went online in September 1882. By that date, there were almost 100 power plants in the United States and in other countries. 
One quarter of the first clients for electric lighting were textile mills. Electric lighting was far superior to gaslight in those fire-prone places. As an industrial town, Patterson was something of an anomaly. It was unusual, not because it depended on immigrant labor, but because it depended on skilled immigrant labor. The power loom came to silk only in the 1870s. Equipped with an automatic device that stopped the loom when the silk thread broke, the new loom could be attended by women and girls, a less expensive and initially more manageable source of labor. Girls and women had always been a significant segment of the Patterson silk industry's workforce. Women and children traditionally staffed the throwing, that is, the spinning establishments. In the weaving mills, women as well as men were weavers and warpers, though men traditionally predominated as weavers. The dye houses were the bastion of male workers. Growth of the silk industry was rapid after the Civil War. By 1875, the silk mills employed 8,000 operatives, two-thirds of whom were female and one-quarter of whom were teenagers. Women's work in the silk mills was considered to be more desirable than work in the cotton or jute mills, where workers were subjected to lint-laden air, sprays of water, and other unhealthful conditions. Silk mills had to be relatively clean and well-lit to assure the production of high-quality fabrics. Nevertheless, the workday was a long 10 hours, and tending the various machines required constant attentiveness standing, stooping, and sometimes lifting of equipment. The mills varied considerably in the quality of the sanitary facilities and fire safety they provided. Most were poorly ventilated and stuffy in the summer and cold in the winter. Employers assumed little responsibility when workers were injured on the job. By using the latest technology, Patterson's manufacturers captured markets from the less mechanized European silk industry and also attracted capital away from Patterson's older industries. By 1900, they had succeeded in making Patterson into Silk City, the Lyon of America. The first ribbon and broad silk weavers in Patterson owned their own looms and supplied power with their hands and feet. From the silk centers of France, Germany, Switzerland, and especially England, they had come to Patterson in the 1860s and 1870s, bringing their traditional work habits and a sense of their traditional rights. Working in teams of seven or eight under the supervision of a dyer, the dyer's helpers added chemicals to silk yarn in large tubs. Their working conditions were the worst in the silk industry. The militant tradition of the dyer's helpers was rooted in the Italian community of Patterson. Many who came in the 1880s were northern Italians who had worked as weavers in Piedmont or as dyers in Lombardy. They became skilled dyers and weavers in Patterson. After 1890, however, southern Italians with no experience in textiles began to arrive in great numbers to work as dyer's helpers. During the 1890s, Patterson became the international center of Italian anarchism. In July 1900, the King of Italy was assassinated by an anarchist from Patterson. Jews migrated to Patterson in large numbers only after the turn of the century. By 1910, there were between 3,000 and 5,000 working in the silk industry, mostly in broad silk weaving. To the newcomers from the Polish textile towns of Ludz and Bialystok, the German Jews seem more German than Jewish. The Jews from Poland organized through the workmen's circle, just as the Italians were united through the sons of Italy. The powerful alliance between Italians and Jews and their somewhat shakier alliance with English-speaking weavers were initially forged in the crucible of the broad silk industry in response to the manufacturer's attempts to increase loom assignments. In 1910, a Patterson broad silk manufacturer named Henry Dougherty increased the loom assignments of some of his weavers to four. 
When Dougherty began to implement his plan, his Weavers Twice went out on strike. Ordered back by union officials, they turned to another union, Local 25 of the Socialist Labor Party. In January 1913, Dougherty's Broad Silk Weavers went on strike yet again. This time, they turned to Local 152 of the Industrial Workers of the World. The Wobblies, as they were called, had attracted the attention of the press after their victory in a strike of textile mills in Lawrence, Massachusetts in 1912. William D. Haywood, known as Big Bill Haywood, who helped to found the IWW as a revolutionary alternative to the American Federation of Labor, always emphasized its radical goal. Much of the organization of women in the strike fell to Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. She was 22 at the time of the strike and had already spent several years in the public eye as an effective organizer for the IWW. Her personal charisma was not lost on Patterson. As one local newspaper characterized her, she possessed the appearance of a child, the garb of a working girl, the skill of a politician, and the silver tongue of an orator. On Tuesday morning, February 25th, 1913, Broad Silk Weavers went to work at the usual time of 7 o'clock. They left work one hour later, as planned, and marched to Turn Hall. The last speaker that morning was Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. After her speech, the hall began to empty. Patterson Police Chief John Bimson and four detectives approached Flynn and the other out-of-town speakers. He gave them the choice of leaving town permanently or being arrested. Flynn and her fellow IWW organizer Carlo Tresker insisted on their rights and were arrested. As the captives were led out of Turn Hall, in the words of a New York Call reporter, 1,500 strikers waiting outside nearly went wild at seeing Miss Flynn in the clutches of Bimson. On the way to the police station, all the efforts of four mounted policemen and the frightful clubbing meted out to the marchers failed to disperse Miss Flynn's escort. In May, the strike entered a new phase. Matching the unity and determination of the strikers with unity and determination of their own, the mill owners tightened the pressure and developed strategies to break the strike. On May 20th, strikers arriving for the morning meeting found Turn and Helvetia Hall closed and surrounded by police. Stunned and furious, they were about to resist when Patrick Quinlan, one of the strike leaders, came by and shouted, on to Halden. Halden, a working class suburb with a socialist mayor, had been used whenever the Patterson police intensified repression in Patterson. Now more meetings would be held in Halden to let the strikers protest and regroup. The biggest event was a speech by Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, who was already tremendously popular with the strikers. High on a hill overlooking a large green, which was almost enclosed by a semicircle of woods, the second-story balcony of the house of Pietro Bado provided the speakers, in Flynn's words, with a natural platform and amphitheater. Toward the end of each meeting, someone, often Flynn, would go through the great crowd, taking a collection for the relief fund. Hungry, lacking their usual means of communication, and increasingly isolated, the strikers found themselves under siege in Patterson. After three months, the strike as a way of life had exhausted local resources and was in danger of being unable to sustain itself. A tactic used successfully in the Lawrence, Massachusetts strike was to evacuate from the city the children of strikers. The intent was to relieve pressure on the hungry families of strikers, to put pressure on the manufacturers to settle, and to develop sympathy for the strike in other parts of the country. A committee was organized in New York to handle the placement and care of the children. The committee was headed by 30-year-old Margaret Sanger, who had organized the evacuation of the children in Lawrence, and who later achieved fame as an advocate of birth control. The Patterson Municipal Relief Office had learned from the Lawrence experience and prepared a plan for aid to forestall the negative impact that a children's exodus would create. The first group of children left Patterson by truck on May 1st, accompanied by Sanger. 
The children arrived in New York City in time for the May Day Parade. Over the next few weeks, more than 300 children left Patterson to be cared for by families in New York, Brooklyn, and Elizabeth, New Jersey. Though the city's relief plan had prevented a public relations debacle to match Lawrence's, the hardship of the Patterson strikers was still revealed through this exodus. Elizabeth Gurley Flynn recalled one particular meeting held during the strike. A touching episode occurred at one of our children's meetings. I was speaking in simple language about the conditions of silk workers, why their parents had to strike. I spoke of how little they were paid for weaving the beautiful silk, like the Lawrence workers who made the fine war woolen cloth. Yet the textile workers do not wear either woolen or silk, while the rich people wear both. I asked, do you wear silk? They answered in a lively chorus, no. I asked, does your mother wear silk? Again, there was a loud no. But a child's voice interrupted, making a statement. This is what he said. My mother has a silk dress. My father spoiled the cloth and had to bring it home. The silk worker had to pay for the piece he spoiled. And only then did his wife get a silk dress. In the spring of 1913, visitors from Greenwich Village came to Patterson, drawn by their desire to see the strike. The Silk Strikers and the IWW needed new allies to help break the deadlock in Patterson. The village intellectuals needed to test their ideas and abilities in a practical situation. At the end of April, in an apartment of a schoolteacher friend of Haywood near Washington Square, New York socialite Mabel Dodge suggested staging a pageant in New York City about the strike, and socialist journalist John Reed volunteered to take charge of the production. The Patterson Silk Workers took over Madison Square Garden on Saturday night, June 7th. An overflow crowd of 15,000 people watched the Silk Workers enact the major events of the strike. Great as it was, the pageant could not win the strike. The more money came into the relief fund from New York, more and more strikers needed relief. Finally, more than seven weeks after the pageant, the silk workers returned to the mills. One year after the 1913 strike, the weavers and dyers helpers were working 10 hours, and the broad silk weavers were tending two looms, as they had before the strike. The manufacturers had not won an increase in loom assignments, and the silk workers had not won a decrease in the hours of work. In popular memory, the 1913 strike became associated with the decline of Patterson, with violence, and with un-American radicalism. Thus, the democratic and nonviolent nature of the strike and the communal support it received from the workmen's circle and the Sons of Italy had been transformed into the opposite. In 1900, the American historian Henry Adams visited the Hall of Dynamos at the Great Exposition in Paris. Writing about himself in the third person, Adams described the experience. As he grew accustomed to the great gallery of machines, he began to feel the 40-foot dynamos as a moral force, much as the early Christians felt the cross. The planet itself seemed less impressive in its old-fashioned, deliberate, annual or daily revolution than this huge wheel revolving within arm's length at some vertiginous speed and barely murmuring. Before the end, one began to pray to it. Inherited instinct taught the natural expression of man before silent and infinite force. Among the thousands of symbols of ultimate energy, the dynamo was not so human as some, but it was the most expressive. It had been only 24 years since William Dean Howells was awestruck by the huge cordless steam engine at the Philadelphia Centennial Exposition. In Paris at the dawn of the 20th century, Henry Adams sensed 
like William Dean Howells before him, that technology was not a neutral force. This was to have profound economic and social implications for the New Jersey legacy.